On today's episode, we are out here taking a look at the all new 2017 Infiniti QX30. Now, if you're watching this video from outside the United States, you might know the blue vehicle sitting right next to me as the Infiniti Q30S. However, in the United States, the Q30, the Q30S, and the QX30 are all sold as the QX30. That might sound crazy at first glance, but when you think about it, it actually makes a bit more sense because there is relatively little competition for the Q30 or the Q30S in the United States. Well, the rest of the world gets, of course, the Mercedes-Benz A-Class hatchback, the 2 Series Active Tourer hatchback, the A3 hatchback, the V40 hatchback, etc. In the United States, the only two luxury hatchbacks in this size category are the Lexus CT200H and the Audi A3 e-tron. The Lexus is, of course, a hybrid, and the Audi A3 is a plug-in hybrid, so neither is the same thing as the Q30S or the regular Q30. Instead of that category of vehicles, the United States gets the Mercedes-Benz GLA crossover, the BMW X1 crossover, the Audi Q3 crossover, etc., so you can see why Infiniti is calling all of them the QX30. The front end design looks very much like the Infiniti Q50 and the Q60. We have these angry headlamps with LED light pipes. Our model also has full LED headlamps and these steer in the corners. A nice touch is that both the low beams and the high beams steer in corners, and that's somewhat unusual. We have this large open mouth grille right up front, large Infiniti logo. Behind that is a radar adaptive cruise control sensor, LED fog lamps on either side of this large lower grille. Now the front end look changes based on the model that you get. There's a slightly different look for the QX30, the QX30 all wheel drive, or the QX30 Sport. The big difference of course is that the QX30 all wheel drive is more of an Audi Q3 competitor or a BMW X1 competitor, so it gets a look that looks a little bit more like a crossover. The biggest differentiator between the three different flavors of the QX30 is the ride height. Now, of course, because the QX30 was designed to straddle the regular hatchback, station wagon segment, and the crossover segment, we get 6.1 inches of ground clearance in the lowest to the ground model, which is the Sport that we're driving right here. As far as comparisons go, that's actually one inch higher off the ground than a regular Q50. Next, we have the base QX30, which has a ride height of 6.8 inches. That's about the same as the Audi Q3. Then we have the QX30 all-wheel drive, which is the SUV version, and that gives us 8 inches of ground clearance, about 1 inch higher than a BMW X1. Before we go much further, we should also talk about the relationship between the QX30 and the Mercedes-Benz CLA and GLA. As you may have heard, this vehicle is closely related to those Mercedes-Benz models. But very importantly, the QX30 was not designed by Mercedes. This was actually designed by Infiniti. However, Infiniti had access to the Mercedes-Benz parts bin. That means that underneath the very Infiniti sheet metal, we have a Mercedes-Benz structure to the vehicle. We have Mercedes-Benz crash structures, front and rear. We have a Mercedes-Benz engine under the hood. However, it is actually built in a Nissan factory in Tennessee. Inside the cabin, we get an Infiniti infotainment system, but a Mercedes-Benz steering wheel and seat controls, but Infiniti seats. The suspension system was specifically designed for the QX30 by Infiniti as well. And perhaps most telling, of course, the entire vehicle is actually manufactured in the United Kingdom in a Nissan factory, not in Germany in a Mercedes-Benz factory. At 174.2 inches long, this slots right between the Mercedes-Benz GLA and the BMW X1 in terms of overall size. Some of you over at facebook.com slash alexnautos were wondering how this compares to the Lexus NX. The NX is actually a BMW X3 competitor, and as a result, it is eight inches longer than this. That's because this is a subcompact crossover, not a compact crossover. Moving all the way to the back, we have a rear window that is definitely very sloped that does cut down on cargo practicality in the back, and we have an overall shape that definitely is somewhere between your average crossover and a hatchback. Of course, that's not too unusual in this segment because the former BMW X1 had the same sort of look. The current Mercedes-Benz GLA definitely has a very hatchback theme to it. And if you were to expand the pool and look at this as an alternative to something like a Mazda CX-3 that also has a more hatchback-like profile right behind there. Again, this may look a little bit more familiar to some of our European friends because in Europe we do have vehicles like the Volvo V40 and the off-road version of the V40, which again has a more hatchback look in the rear. The difference in styling between the Sport and the all-wheel drive model is perhaps most noticeable out back. The Sport model gets an entirely different lower bumper treatment that definitely looks more like a hatchback than a crossover. We have dual exhaust tips, ours are dark tinted because we're in the Sport model, and everybody gets angry LED tail lamps. In the United States, we get just one engine under the hood. It's a two liter, four cylinder turbocharged engine that's essentially shared with the Infiniti Q50 in its base form, as well as the Mercedes-Benz CLA and GLA in the United States. It produces 208 horsepower and 258 pound-feet of torque. 
The engine is mated to a 7-speed dual-clutch transmission, also designed by Mercedes, and it sends power to either the front wheels or all four wheels. Now, interestingly enough, you cannot get the sport model that we're driving right here with all-wheel drive. The sport model and the base model are front-wheel drive only. Combined fuel economy for the base trim and the sport trim we're driving right here comes in at 27 miles per gallon. And if you get the all-wheel drive version, that drops down to 25. Front seat comfort is excellent if you get the base model or the all-wheel drive model. It does lower just one point for me down to 9 out of 10 points in the sport trim. The reason is primarily the headrest design because the sport trim does get a seat with an integrated headrest that is not adjustable and it hits me just between the shoulder blades so it's a little bit on the low side if you are about six feet tall or over. The rest of the seat design, however, is excellent for this segment. The seats are very supportive and the sport trim gets a little bit of extra bolstering to help keep you in the seat. In addition to a four-way adjustable lumbar support and seat memory for both the driver and front passenger, our model also has a tilt telescopic steering column with a very wide range of motion. One thing you'll definitely notice in this segment is that you'll find more adjustable seats and memory seats for the passenger at price points you don't find in the competition from Europe. The front seats are an area where we see a blending of Mercedes and Infiniti together because the seats themselves are definitely an Infiniti design, but the seat controls are Mercedes and they're right here on the front doors. The rear passenger area scores 7 out of 10 points. We find more room back here than in something like a Mercedes-Benz CLA or the Mercedes-Benz GLA, but less than you'll find in a BMW X1 for sure. You'll also find more room back here than you'll find in something like a Mazda CX-3 or a Mercedes-Benz CLA sedan, which will also be competition to the QX30. It's very obvious when we move over to the right side of the vehicle that this is a subcompact car because my feet don't really fit in the footwell back there behind this front seat. The front seat is all the way back in its tracks. I comfortably had a six foot five passenger up front. Headroom was not a problem for him, nor was legroom, but you can definitely see it cuts down on the legroom in the back row. That is, of course, because this is a subcompact crossover, not a compact crossover, so you should expect subcompact style room back here. That also means that fitting three adults across the rear bench seat is going to be very cozy. When it comes to headroom in the back, my hair is brushing the ceiling, but my head is not touching the ceiling. And of course, we have fixed headrests back here, just like we have up front. Because this is a subcompact crossover, we obviously find less cargo space behind the hatch than in Infiniti's compact crossover, the QX50. That means that I was not able to put four of these 24 inch roller bags back here, but I was able to put three of them and one 22 inch roller bag. The actual cargo volume comes in at 19 cubic feet. That is definitely below the BMW X1 at 27 cubic feet because it has a very square rear cargo area. And again, we have this definitely slanted rear glass back here, which means you can't put these bags in the upright position. This is also about four cubic feet less space than you'll find in a Volkswagen Golf hatchback, but notably more than you'll find in something like a Mazda CX-3, which only has 12 cubic feet of space. This is also about two cubic feet more than you'll find in the Mercedes-Benz GLA. The cargo area cover in the QX30 is one of these hard, non-folding, non-rolling varieties that does make it a little bit less convenient because you have to put this somewhere if you want to put more cargo in the back of your QX30. The rear seats, of course, fold in a 60-40 folding fashion, and we actually have a ski pass-through right back here on the 60% side, which is a nice touch. Another nice touch is that the shoulder belt for the center passenger comes right here out of the seat back, not out of the ceiling. Because of the lack of a spare tire and the fact that this cargo area has this definite slope to it, rather than a more upright profile, which would mean you could put more stuff in the back, I'm going to have to give this 7 out of 10 points in our exclusive trunk comfort index. Although this cargo compartment is certainly more practical than the CX-3 or the GLA 250, the BMW X1 will hold a lot more stuff in the back. We do, however, have a nice helper handle to help you close the lid. The model that we're driving has this faux suede Alcatara headliner, which is very attractive, and we also have this large panoramic moonroof. However, this does not open. It is just a fixed pane of glass. You can see it extends almost over the rear seats right there. The driver and the front passenger get height adjustable seat belts, but the headrests are fixed into place because we are in the sport trim. We also have ambient lighting right under the headrest in the sport model. It comes in right here between the headrest and the rest of the seat. The sport model also features these leather seats with contrasting stitching and contrasting leather inserts. The front door panels are mostly soft touch plastic. We have a soft touch injection molded upper section and then of course this leather wrapped section right here for the armrest. The interior design of the QX30 is certainly Infiniti, but we also see a high number of Mercedes parts in here. So these seat controls, the memory controls, the door lock and unlock buttons, and the window switch, those are all out of the Mercedes-Benz parts bin. However, the design and all the other materials that you're seeing are definitely Infiniti. 
and we actually see more soft touch materials and a little bit more attention to detail in some of the areas in this cabin than we find in the Mercedes-Benz GLA 250, although we do find a little bit less wood in this cabin than in the Mercedes. The upper portion of the door panel is a soft touch injection molded plastic. Then we have this soft touch stitched armrest and insert right there. And then we do have hard plastics lower on the door panel right by that storage cubby. Moving from the door panels on over to the dashboard, we find more of this stitched trim right here in this midsection between the soft touch injection molded upper portion of the dashboard and the hard touch lower portion of the dashboard. On the passenger side, we find a fairly compact glove compartment. I was not able to fit a large tablet computer inside. In fact, the user manual is just about all that will fit in there. Moving over to the dashboard, we find more of that stitched material. We have a hood that covers both the instrument cluster for the driver and the infotainment system. The infotainment system is an Infinity infotainment system. It's very closely related to what we see in the Infinity Q50. As we see with other Infinity models, this is a touch screen. So you can control this either with your touch or you can control it via the knob in the center console. As with the Infinity Q50, we have limited app integration, but we do not have Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. I find this software a little bit more intuitive than what we find in the Mercedes-Benz GLA, primarily because of this touchscreen. It makes interacting with the system just a little bit easier. One thing worth noting, however, is that this touchscreen is definitely smaller than the screens that we find in some of the competition. Although Infinity was not able to put all of their latest electronic gadgets into the QX30, their 360 degree camera system did manage to make it. It also has moving object detection. Below the infotainment screen, we find two large air vents, basically the same key that we find in a variety of different Mercedes models. Then we have the controls for the infotainment and navigation system, single slot optical displayer, number of direct access buttons, and preset buttons. Below that, we find the controls for the heated seats, a button to enable and disable the start-stop system and the parking sensors. And then we have a very similar two-zone climate control system to certain Mercedes models. We have knobs on each side that allow you to adjust the temperature. In front of the shifter, we have a small cubby with two USB inputs and not quite enough room to store something like my iPhone 7 Plus right there. The shifter is very similar to one that we see in certain Mercedes models. It's a joystick style. So if you want to put the vehicle in drive, you put your foot on the brake, pull back. We have drive right there. We push forward for reverse and it always returns to center. If you want neutral, that's just one click backwards. If you're in reverse or if we're in the drive mode, we just click one click forward. To put the vehicle in park, we either hit the P button right here or you can actually turn off the vehicle and it will automatically park itself. In case you're wondering, the vehicle will also automatically park itself if you open the front door. The ESM button changes the way the transmission behaves between economy, sport mode, and the manual mode. Behind the shifter, we find two large cup holders and the controls for the infotainment and navigation system. Again, the system can be controlled either via the touchscreen or via this controller right here in the center console. We have some dedicated buttons that take you to the home menu, audio menu, map interface, 360 degree camera system, which our vehicle has, a back button, and this button toggles side to side, up and down, rotates around, and of course clicks to OK. Between the front seats, we have a softly padded armrest. It opens to reveal a fairly small storage cubby. We have a 12 volt power outlet, and not too much other than a wallet or some other small items will fit in there. Over on the driver's side, we have a four dial instrument cluster with a color multifunction display in the middle. The multifunction displays where we find things like our transmission mode indicator, whether we're in the manual mode and what gear we are in if we're in that manual mode. We also have a digital speedometer, odometer readouts, miles per gallon, range, our trip computer information. We also have navigation information, turn by turn directions there, audio system information. We can also see the status of certain safety systems. You'll notice this is the same display that we find in certain Mercedes models because this is the same system. Because Infinity chose to share certain parts with the CLA and the GLA, we also find certain vehicle settings inside this control as well. The steering wheel is a flat bottom three spoke design, again very similar to what we see in certain Mercedes models. You'll find the controls for that multifunction display over here on the left side of the steering wheel, the controls for the infotainment system over here on the right, along with a voice command button. The shift paddles are on the back of the steering wheel. We have up on the right, down on the left, and they move with the steering wheel. You'll find the controls for the adaptive cruise control system on the left side of the steering column. We rotate this knob around to increase or decrease the following distance toggle the stock up and down to accelerate or decelerate, and we pull in to resume and push forward to cancel. Out on the road, the QX30 reminds me a great deal of the previous generation Volkswagen GTI, especially in the sport trim that we're driving right here. This has a much firmer suspension and sportier overall feel compared to the rest of the QX30 lineup. 
In addition to the much firmer suspension and the lowered ride height, the Sport model also gets an upgraded brake package. Now, most importantly, the one thing we don't get in the Sport model is any more power. And that means all versions of the QX30 that are front-wheel drive will run from 0 to 60 in 6.4 seconds, which is what we scored in this model. 6.4 seconds, 0 to 60 is a little bit behind the BMW X1 with its brand new 8-speed automatic transmission. However, it is a little bit faster than the last Mercedes-Benz GLA 250 that we tested. The big reason for that is that the Mercedes-Benz was an all-wheel drive model, and I do expect the all-wheel drive version of the QX30 to go from 0 to 60 basically the same speed as that GLA 250. We have exactly the same engine under the hood, same transmission, and the vehicle weighs about the same as the GLA 250 as well. Now this is notably quicker than the Audi Q3, which does 0 to 60 in 7.6 seconds. That is quite slow for this category. If you're comparing this to something like a Mazda CX-3, this is significantly faster, but if you're comparing this to something like a Volkswagen GTI, the Volkswagen will be quicker. It's going to be 5.75 seconds because it gets more power under the hood in its current version. Thanks to the braking upgrade, we ran from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 106 feet, which is incredibly short. That's thanks not only to the tires that we find in this model, but also that upgraded brake package. Not only are the stopping distances short, but fade resistance is also very, very good thanks to the upgrade. In a quick test in a dealer-provided all-wheel drive model, we were still able to stop from 60 miles an hour to zero in 112 feet, which is a very good score for this segment. When it comes to handling, I'm going to give the Sport trim, which is the model we're driving, an A. Now, if you get the other versions of the QX30, I'm going to drop that down to a B. The primary reason that the QX30 falls below some of the competition in terms of handling is because of the tire size. We find just one tire size on the QX30. It's a 235 width tire. And some of the Audi Q3 models that you'll find on dealer lots, actually most of them on dealer lots, are equipped with 255 with tires. The Q3 handles incredibly well in this particular segment. It is quite slow, 0 to 60, but it will actually hold the road better than the Q30 Sport. However, the Q30 Sport does have a slight edge on something like a Mercedes-Benz GLA 250 because Mercedes does not have a suspension tune like this Sport model. There is, of course, the GLA 45 AMG, but this doesn't compete with that. This is the same kind of power we find in the average entry in this segment with improved handling and a firmer suspension. Although BMW's brand new X1 handles well for this segment, it is no longer the undoubted handling champion that it once was. The suspension tuning is very noticeable out here on this gravel road because all versions of the QX30 are certainly firm, but the QX30 Sport is definitely the firmest. When it comes to the ride score, I'm going to have to give the Sport model a C- because, of course, we are trading ride for handling ability, and this is, again, a very, very firm ride for this segment. Back out here on the paved road, as I said before, it's obvious that the suspension was tuned for performance and for handling because we can feel some of the minor imperfections on this road. However, it makes the QX30 Sport an awful lot of fun. And that's again why this reminds me a great deal of the Volkswagen GTI. This is an awful lot of fun to drive out here on your favorite winding mountain road. Although I do have to say that I wish the QX30 Sport also got the all-wheel drive system that we find in the other QX30 model. Because there is enough torque out of this engine, especially if you're out on a slippery road where it's been raining, definitely get the front tires loose. In the cabin noise score, the model we're driving scored 73 decibels, which does make this a little bit loud for this segment, so I'm going to have to give this a C. Most of the competition is quieter out on the road, and it seems to mainly be road noise. Again, we do have 235 with tires on this vehicle, so they're not exceptionally wide for this segment. I think the prime reason for the score is just that we have a little bit less sound deadening in the wheel wells than we find in some of the competition, including the related GLA 250. There are two big reasons that we find a dual clutch transmission under this hood. The first one, of course, is performance, because dual clutch transmissions can shift faster than a traditional automatic transmission. The second one is fuel economy, and we have been averaging 27 and a half miles per gallon in this model. That's above what the EPA says we should be getting. That shouldn't really surprise anybody, of course, because every vehicle that this two liter four cylinder engine is in seems to perform above and beyond its EPA test scores, whether we're talking about the Infiniti Q50 or the Mercedes-Benz GLA or CLA. The big reason that dual clutch transmissions are more efficient than traditional automatics is because we don't have a torque converter under the hood. So instead of the drivetrain loss being somewhere around 15%, the drivetrain loss in this vehicle is probably somewhere around 8%. 
Speaking of transmissions, this is essentially the same seven speed transmission that we find under the hood of the CLA and the GLA. However, Infiniti has reprogrammed the transmission, so this does not use the same software as the Mercedes models. The software difference is not night and day, but it is very noticeable. It makes this dual clutch transmission much more similar to Audi's or Volkswagen's dual clutch transmissions, which I think are the best in the industry right now. Now again, this will never feel like a traditional automatic, so if you're crawling along in slow traffic, it's going to feel more like a manual transmission because it is a manual transmission under the hood. This manual transmission just happens to be shifted by the computer. Like the Volkswagen GTI and actually like the Mazda 3 as well, we actually get a hint of steering feedback from the front tires. That's a little bit unusual these days because electric power steering really has numbed a lot of vehicles out there. But they've really done a good job about trying to bring some of the feedback from the road back to the driver. Mercedes-Benz makes hands down one of the most engaging front wheel drive vehicles sold in the United States. And almost all of that translates right into the QX30. With a base price of $29,950, the QX30 is the least expensive entry in this fairly new subcompact luxury crossover market. The base model comes fairly well equipped, however, as we've started to expect from luxury car companies, we don't get a few things in that base model that you might expect to see in a luxury car, like power seats or leather upholstery. The base model does get leatherette, although we do get two-zone automatic climate control and four-way power lumbar support on the driver's seat. The realistic base price for the QX30 is the $32,600 luxury package equipped model that gives you leather upholstery, power front seats, and ambient lighting, the basics that most luxury shoppers seem to expect these days. It's worth noting that all-wheel drive is not available on the base trim. You do have to move up one model on the trim ladder in order to get it. The sport trim again gives us the 19-inch wheels, the lowered suspension, the sport brake, sport steering wheel, parking sensors, and 360-degree camera. Now you can equip a premium all-wheel drive to be just about as expensive as a top-end trim of the sport, but you're getting that all-wheel drive system and you're trading away the sportier suspension and the bigger brakes. When it comes to the competition, there are really only three, possibly four entries in the luxury segment that compete directly with the QX30. We have the BMW X1, the Audi Q3, the Mercedes-Benz GLA, which is again related to the QX30, and I suppose you could say the Lexus CT200H. But of course, if you include the Lexus, then you might as well include the Audi A3 e-tron, although it's not quite the same thing as the QX30. You might be wondering why I'm saying Lexus CT, not Lexus NX. The reason is that Lexus does not have a vehicle that directly competes in this particular segment. The NX is actually a BMW X3 Audi Q5 competitor. It is 8 inches longer than the QX30, 3 inches wider, 6 inches taller, 650 pounds heavier. It's just not the same kind of vehicle. A lot of people confuse the positioning of the Lexus NX because the Lexus RX also exists. And the Lexus RX is actually about the same size as the BMW X5. Let's start out our comparison section with the BMW X1. The X1 was formerly easily the most fun entry in this segment. It also had this appearance of being more of a hatchback than an SUV, kind of what's going on with the QX30. But the current generation BMW X1 is quite different. BMW decided to make the vehicle bigger, softer, more family friendly, more practical as well, but a little bit less fun. As with every other entry in this segment, the current generation BMW X1 starts out as a front-wheel drive vehicle. The front-wheel drive nature of the new X1 really has changed the character of the vehicle, and it is no longer the overall handling winner in this segment. I would actually say that goes to either the GLA 45 AMG or top-end trims of the Audi Q3. Although the X1 is a lot less fun than it used to be, and it's a little bit more expensive than the QX30, starting at $33,100, the all-wheel drive models are going to be a little bit closer in terms of price comparisons, and the X1 is going to give you a great deal more room in the back seat and a great deal more room in the cargo area. It has a shape of a more traditional SUV or crossover, and it gives you that more practical rear end. The downside to the added practicality is that the X1 is not as much fun as it used to be, and the Infiniti is more fun on your favorite winding mountain road than the comparable BMW. That's especially true for the QX30 Sport, even though it's not quite as fast 0 to 60 as the X1. Next up, we have the Audi Q3. It's an excellent all around value. It has a fairly low starting price for this segment at $31,800 and a very well priced all wheel drive model at $33,900. The all wheel drive trim is a little bit less expensive than the Infiniti. 
I like the way the Q3 looks on the outside, but on the inside it does look to be a little bit behind the times. The reason for that is that the Q3 may be new to America, but it's not new to the worldwide market. Audi released it in Europe several years ahead of releasing it to the United States, and that's why the interior comes across as a little bit old school Audi, not thoroughly modern Audi. The Q3 has a practical interior and handling in most trims is absolutely excellent because they put some seriously wide tires on most versions of the Q3 that you'll find on the dealer lot. On the downside, it is very slow for this segment. Obviously a tough competitor to the QX30 is the closely related Mercedes-Benz GLA 250. The GLA is more expensive than the QX30. It starts at $32,850 and you don't necessarily get much more standard equipment. Although you can get into an all-wheel drive GLA 250 for about the same price as the QX30, $34,850, you're not going to find the same level of equipment in that base all-wheel drive Mercedes versus the all-wheel drive Infiniti. So if you're looking for Mercedes-Benz driving dynamics, but at a lower price, the QX30 is actually a good option for you there. Now, interestingly enough, if you park the QX30 and the GLA 250 next to one another, it's really hard to tell that they're related. Mercedes did not design the QX30. Infiniti designed the QX30, but they had access to the Mercedes-Benz part catalog. And that's why they don't look alike on the outside, but when you hop on the inside, we see a lot of common parts. In terms of overall driving dynamics, the two vehicles are very similar. The big thing to keep in mind is the tire choice on the Infiniti. For some reason, Infiniti didn't use ultra grippy tires even on the Sport trim, and that does limit things just a little bit. However, the overall suspension tune is such that if you put summer tires on the QX30, it would definitely outhandle the GLA 250. The Sport trim of the QX30 really is an interesting twist because there isn't a similar vehicle by anyone in this particular segment. Now Mercedes does offer a GLA 45 AMG, which is their insane performance version of the GLA, but they don't offer anything in between. Although the Mercedes and the Infiniti share the same transmission, the Infiniti software is much more refined than the Mercedes software. You should also keep in mind that options on the GLA 250 can get very expensive. So even though the base price is somewhat close to the QX30, by the time you start adding options to your GLA 250, you can easily get it more expensive. Next up, we have the Lexus CT200H. At $31,250, it's definitely in the same pricing range as the QX30. But the CT doesn't really have a QX30 corollary. It is a dedicated hybrid model, all-wheel drive is not available, and it is certainly more hatchback than crossover. The CT uses a variant of the previous generation Toyota Prius drivetrain, and so it is by far the least powerful in this segment. The flip side, of course, is that it has the best fuel economy. The smallest and least expensive crossover from Lexus is the NX200T, but it starts at $35,285. That's about $6,000 more than the QX30. If you want all-wheel drive, it'll set you back $36,685, which is a little bit closer in terms of overall price, until you start taking a look at what kind of feature content we get in that base all-wheel drive model, and then it's still going to be decently more expensive than the Infiniti. That's because the Lexus NX really is more of an Infiniti QX50 competitor, not the QX30. Part of the reason that a lot of people want to compare the NX to the QX30, however, is that it is a very good value in that next segment up. It has one of the lowest starting prices, one of the lowest comparable feature equipped prices as well. That means that for a relatively small amount of money, you could jump from the QX30 up into a Lexus NX and have the larger vehicle. You'd have a lot more room in the back seat, decent amount more room in the cargo area as well. But it's not really the same kind of vehicle. The NX200T handles fairly well in that segment, however it's not going to handle as well as the QX30 just due to its larger size and heavier curb weight. If however you're looking for something to upgrade from this segment into, but you're not quite ready to pay for a BMW X3, then the NX could seem like a discount option. My overall top pick in this crossover segment has to be the BMW X1. It's well priced, it's also enormous on the inside. My runner-up pick would be the QX30. I think that the balance of handling and acceleration is excellent, and I would take its value proposition over the Mercedes-Benz GLA 250 or over the Audi Q3. The Audi Q3 has a slightly more practical interior. It also handles a little bit better, but it's just too slow. Now, if you're looking for something just a little bit off the beaten path, I would definitely put the QX30 on your shopping list. There really isn't anything comparable in the Audi, BMW, or Mercedes lineups. Now, I really wish that Infiniti would put all-wheel drive on the QX30 Sport. I would also like it if they put a little bit more power into that model, but as it is, it's an absolutely excellent performance buy. If you get the QX30 Sport and put some stickier aftermarket tires on it, it's definitely going to run rings around most of the other options. 
And of course, if you're thinking about doing that, you can find a few engine upgrades as well. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Stikes, and this has been the 2017 Infiniti QX30. Be sure and check out the related videos that will appear under me after a few moments. You can also head over to patreon.com and support this channel, and find us over at facebook.com slash alexnados. I'll see you next week.